Okay, so let's start. So sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so let's start talk about the some security improvement in the latest uh, GNU tool chain. So this is a joint talk uh, from me. Uh, my name is Qin uh, from Oracle, and uh, uh, the other person is Sidesh. Sidesh. Uh, he represents uh, Red Hat, but he is remotely, so he will uh, uh, present remotely. Uh, so this is the outline of today's talk. So uh, in the first, I will have a list of the all the uh, most of the new security improvement in the latest uh, GNU GCC, GCC and uh, GLibc. And then we will focus on uh, four of them. Uh, yeah, so the four of them, the, the three, uh, static variable to initialization, the 45 South level three, and the built-in dynamic object size, that's already in GCC 12. But the last one is a new, uh, new project I'm currently doing. That one will uh, hopefully will be in GCC uh, 13, yeah. So, so this is a, a, a list of the new security improvement in the uh, GNU toolchain. Uh, so in uh, most of them already uh, in the GCC 12 and the GLIPC uh, 2.35. Um, the last one, as I just mentioned, is is, is ongoing uh, project. So uh, the highlight highlighted uh, four items. Uh, that's a major topic uh, we will focus on today. Uh, the blue one uh, will I, I will present them, and the orange one, Sidish, uh will present them. Uh, so if you want to get more detail, you can yeah. That's a release notes, yeah, I got this list. Uh, so I think uh, the, the topic we are talking about today mostly are in the middle end and glib C. The straight line spe speculation and the shallow core stack sanitizer, they are all backend uh, stuff, yeah. Mm, okay, let's move on. So I'll first talk about the uh, uh, stack variable auto initialization. Um, uh, yeah, I think the most important thing for this project is the motivation. Why we need to add this feature into GCC. And after that, then uh, I'll uh, describe a little bit about the new features we added into uh, GCC 12. And then the status of this work. Uh, and then the remaining issues uh, we are trying to uh, fix. Um, so for this project, I think the most challenging part is uh, uh, why we need to add this feature. We have a lot of discussing uh, before, uh, during the implementation phase. Yeah, it's going on for many times and the uh, implementation also, uh, yeah, revise, rev revise the multiple times and finally we get a, a agreement and finally this uh, feature get into the GCC 12. The feature already be used by uh, Linux kernel uh, for some time, yeah, and uh, works very well in the Linux kernel. So uh, why, what's the motivation? So first we need to understand the yeah, for C and C++, the auto variable is not, is not initialized by default. So uninitialized variable um, will hold some garbage value from the previous function. So this garbage value will yeah, uh, trigger some incorrect computation and also change, sometimes change the program incorrectly. Uh, sometimes if the attacker uh, initialize, uh, by initialize this variable by some other way, then the, uh, the attacker will enable some malicious code execution. And sometimes it will cause some race uh, condition if that variable is uh, 
uh, risk check. Yeah, so a lot of bad, uh, bad thing will happen. So we need to eliminate the uninitialized variable uh, completely. I think we should uh, eliminate it completely, ideally. But it's not an easy, uh, easy task to fix uh, all the uninitialized variable. So in order to identify all the uninitialized variable, there are quite some tools uh, come up. They are static tools and dynamic tools. And uh, yeah, uh, many uh, GCC clone and uh, a lot of uh, commercial compiler provide the static tools and also the dynamic tools, yeah. But the, there are limitations with both all these tools. So static tools, we, we know most of the static tools based on the intra-procedure analysis. So it has some limitations as I list here. Yeah, so usually uh, for in, inside the function, it, the compiler might assume, that there are some assumption, assume the, all the parameter come in to the function is initialized, but actually they might not be initialized. And also, uh, we, all, we know the array element and the pointer analysis, those kind of things as the uh, hard part to be analyzed very accurately in the compiler. And also there are some conditional expression cannot be evaluated accurately uh, during the uh, compiler analysis. So all this limitation, um, yeah, uh, limit the static tools accuracy. And also the dynamic tools, although it can uh, report some very accurate result, but because it's a runtime, runtime tool, so runtime it cannot execute all the paths, the static paths, so it cannot catch all the uh, cases as well. Um, and also the runtime tools has the uh, other issue, runtime overhead, sometimes it's very big and the size of the log file is very huge. So it's, you take a lot of uh, effort to locate the problem, yeah. So that's, big, that's the limitation of all these tools. So because we have those limitations of the tools, so it's impossible, I think practically it's impossible to identify all the uninitialized variable and uh, fix them manually. So I think um, company always want to provide a, a protection uh, very secure. So the last line of the defense, I think, the compiler need to provide a automatically feature to uh, add the auto initialization uh, in the last step, that's the last step, yeah. So I think it's necessary and uh, many uh, commercial, uh, some other com commercial compiler and also clone, they all, all support this feature already, yeah, so they, their compiler provide the pattern initialization or the zero initialization. Uh, so if you want to get more detail, you can refer to those uh, link I put in this slide. And uh, usually the pattern initialization just uh, initialize, uh, uh, pattern initialization is usually used in the development stage uh, and uh, for the debugging purpose. And the zero initialization used in the production stage uh, for the uh, security purpose. So that's the uh, yeah, situation of other compiler. So GCC, I think, yeah, GCC in order to be com compete with other compiler, we need this feature uh, too. So yeah, in, during the time frame of GCC 12, uh, we have a lot of discussing on this feature and finally we agreed on this uh, new feature. It's a new option uh, with a corresponding new attribute. 
And uh, also, at the same time, we try to keep the current static warning uh, untouched in order to uh, avoid the, there's a lot of complaint on doing this will fork in the language. So keeping the static warning will uh, avoid this kind of complaint. Yeah, so the new option and the new, the new option will has uh, three value. The default is uninitialized. That's the default behavior of the current compiler. And uh, then there are two other level, uh, pattern initialization and zero initialization. Um, pattern initialization uses a value which is a repeated, byte repeated pattern uh, that can likely transform the logical bug into a crash during the runtime. Uh, and uh, we have some discussing on what kind of pattern we will use to initialize the uh, initialize the variables. So after some discussing, we decide in GCC we currently we use the uh, FE uh, FE as a pattern for all the types, but that's uh, de still debatable. Yeah, that's still debatable. For zero initialization, that's yeah very simple. Just use the zero. Yeah. So when this option is specified, uh, so all the uh, variable, uninitialized variable will add uh, uh, explicit initialization uh, by the compiler. So this introduces the runtime overhead. So sometimes the runtime overhead is quite dramatic. dramatic. For example, the big array, those kind of thing, if you, yeah. Some big array, even though there is no explicit initialization, but the programmer know it will be initialized later by a loop. So if you compiler still add initialization for them, that's a redundancy, and uh, the runtime overhead is uh, big. So the attribute is mainly introduced for uh, the performance purpose for uh, exclude uh, this kind of uh, variable from automatically initialization, yeah, to reduce the overhead of the uh, runtime overhead. Yeah, so this is the uh, new features we added into GCC 12. Do you need this? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how this feature relates to the uh, stack scrubbing stuff uh, Alexander mm -hmm. Olivia is working on. I I'm wondering how this work, uh, relates to stack scrubbing, the feature that Alexander Olivia is working on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and then the stack uh, scrubbing, yeah, I basically discussed a little bit with uh, Ale Alex on that, and uh, I think he, he, it's the whole stack. But for this one, I think it's the specific uh, uh, uninitialized variable. Yeah, it's it's related but different. Yeah. And in particular, this will initialize variables will never get put onto the stack. Uh, an initialized variable put into stack, or sometimes it might into register, but register also be initialized. Yeah. Mm. So. With the attribute uninitialized, has there been any discussion to sort of do the inverse, where by default you don't in initialize anything, and then you have an attribute to say zero initialize this variable? Oh. Well, why do you need an attribute if you can just put in initialization? <laughs> well, I guess that answers the question then. <laughs> Quite a stupid one. They are uh, discussing on uh, put the initialization on default. So by default, C initialize the automatic variable. I think that's idea raised by Linux. Li Linux, the, the, the writer of the Linux. Linux, yeah. So, but this, this one, is, yeah, this idea, I don't know whether it's, uh, yeah, feasible or not. Hi, can you hear me? Sidish. Can you hear me? Sidish? Hello? Yes, uh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. Uh, 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 the flag is called trivial, 
uh, out of our init, but it actually initializes all automatic variables, right? You say it initializes arrays. Initializing arrays. Uh, we, yeah. we don't care whether it's in register or not. We don't care. Right. Yeah, we just, if it's, it's an sure, initialized sure, sure. variable, we'll initialize. Uh, whether but it's, what, yeah, whatever it's in register or in the stack, we'll but, do. But what, but what does trivial mean there? What? What does trivial mean in the, in the flag, flag name? Uh, trivial, uh, trivial yeah. mean. Uh, yeah, the trivial, actually, I... I, this is, uh, f the name is follow the clown's name. Yeah, we try to compatible with them. But the trivial is, yes, yeah, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I. Uh, I uh, especially <laughs> especially uh, if you want to use this for security, uh, I would actually uh, uh, only initialize trivial variables, so not arrays and stuff, just uh, short integers. Because for big, for big, big, big arrays, it's a, it's a, a huge performance uh, degradation, right? Used for calculation? Yeah, sorry, I, I don't get your question. Okay. Uh, uh, especially for, uh, uh, if you want to use this auto initialization uh, mm. for performance, uh, if you want to use it for security, I mean, uh, uh, then, then you don't want to initialize big arrays. Uh, if we want to use this feature, then we don't want to use the what? Uh, uh, but because it's such a huge performance degradation. This is not uh, used for the performance. I think this, this feature is mainly used for the security. The, right, it's right. well incur, right. yeah. Right, but if it makes your program a few thousand times slower, it's not good. It's not good for security either because no one will use your program anymore. So you mean if it's uh, performance is not good, then no one will use it, this new feature, right? right? right. Yeah, yes, so, yes, yes, you are, you're making a good point. So, uh, so, tri well, so, tri so trivial auto in it, uh, what this is called, it's, uh, it's, it should probably default to on, only trivial variables, small variables, the simple variables, scalar. Yeah, yeah. I think you are, yeah, so you are, yeah, try to explain what's a trivial, right? Trivial. Right, right. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. Yeah, I think, yeah, you make a good point. If the whole implementation, the performance overhead is too, too much, then no one will use this feature. So one of okay. the, uh, consideration during our implementation is minimize the runtime performance. So, and I have, uh, uh, after the implementation, I have do the experiment, uh, I have run a uh, performance experiment on Spank uh, 2017, uh -huh. and uh, the result is quite good. Yeah, it's, cool. uh, it's quite good, uh, very minimum, because after we, we add this initialization, the compiler optimization, the redundancy elimination path, they can eliminate most of the redundancy. So the right. uh, overhead is not, uh, it's very trivial. So we have data, yeah, we have data. Uh, so it optimizes away your initialization if it can. Mm? It always does that? Uh, 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 well, uh, but, well uh, uh, it says uh, auto initialize, right? So it would yeah, zero it's in the, it's zero always, in the register. Will be optimized. <laughs> Redundancy yeah. will be optimized by the compiler. Okay, yeah, okay, because it's okay, in cool. the very beginning of the compiler phase. So the later optimization will kick in and uh, do the, uh, their, their job. Uh, and I right. also collect some uh, performance data during the development phase. It's very good. Uh, later, when this feature added into Linux, and the case from the Linux group also has performance data. It's uh, also minimum, very minimum, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, is, is something here also used for, uh, for warning when it cannot optimize the way? Uh, for the what? Auto initialization? The, f the feature is used for what? Uh, uh, 
uh, is, uh, does the share code with a uh, warning uh, for initialized variables? You mean the warning? The warning? Yeah. The warning still keeps the original warning. Yeah, we okay, update okay. the warning stage and uh, to ignore those additional fake initialization. So warning still work uh, as good as before. All right. Um, Thanks. Can the, can the new attribute be applied to functions as well as variables? No, no, uh, only in variable. Yeah, because we don't initialize function. Oh, you mean, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will consider that to see whether it's necessary. Mm, okay, yeah, so. I also have a question. Okay. Uh, did you measure the impact on uh, application code size? Uh, code size? Yes. Ah, oh, I think we have some measurement on that too. Uh, I, I, during the development, I measured the runtime performance, the code size data, also the compilation time impact. I think uh, for zero initialization, they are all very minimum. I have all the data, but I didn't put in the slides. They are all minimum, but for the pattern initialization, uh, sometimes it's not that uh, mini minimum, sometimes it has some impact for pattern, because pattern sometimes the, the code generation cannot use very efficient uh, instruction, so it's uh, increase the size, also increase the runtime, yeah. For, but for zero, no problem. Okay, so, oh, okay. If I understand correctly, this means that if the compiler can prove that something's going to be assigned to before it is, it is read in the normal program, then it won't be zero initialized. It'll, the, the, the zero initialization is optimized away. It's not, not, not even there. I understand what's your question. Yes, we have this consideration too during the de uh, development phase. Yes, yeah, zero might be not the, the correct initialization for all the yeah, situation, but what can other value be? Yeah, so after yeah, consideration different, yeah, I think, uh, we, we also we agree zero might be the best uh, value that com compiler can give to the different type. And, and my other question, I mm. think that, that's what somebody on the call was also asking about. The buff, any, uh, you know, uh, arrays or, or buffers that are, that are on the stack, I mean, that are auto, auto variables, they, they also get initialized with this or they don't? Uh, they should. They should. Yeah, okay. they should. Okay. Yeah. But you can disable it by use the attribute. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Mm. Okay, so. No, no more than I go on. Yeah, so the, what we're trying to get is all auto variables that do not have explicit initializer, uh, including the structure patterns, will be initialized by this uh, feature and also keep the warning untouched uh, and minimize the runtime overhead. So that's the uh, three uh, requirement uh, for this whole design, and we meet this requirement, yeah. And the status of the work, uh, the initial patch already, the initial patch already be committed to GCC 12 uh, one year ago, and used by Linux uh, kernel uh, since then, uh, and exposed some issues. Uh, uh, you, uh, in the beginning, mostly is some corner case of the weird type, those kind of thing, and uh, mostly in the pattern initialization. Uh, we fix a lot of uh, bugs uh, since then, and also we enable the warning, yeah, both in the uh, GCC and the analyzer, yeah, the, the analyzer has a similar warning, so we e enable both. And uh, we also add a new warning uh, for sometimes the, this option cannot initialize uh, some 
automatically variable. So during this case, we just uh, uh, want, want the user. Uh, this is not automatically initialized, yeah. So uh, remaining issue uh, for this project is, yeah, I think it's mostly th these two left. Uh, one is the long double and complex double. As some weird condition happens, uh, the padding cannot be cleared. Uh, so this one, I think, is a very corner case and, uh, and need a lot, quite some effort to fix it. So right now it's still open. Another one, yeah, that's a known issue. Yeah, I think during the implementation, the code generation for the pattern initialization is still not very uh, optimal. So we, I, I, I try, try to, if I have spare time, I try to maybe rewrite the pattern initialization in some time, yeah. So this is, I think, yeah, so, you, if you want to get more implementation detail, I have some Im more implementation detail uh, in the last year's LPC. If you want to get more, you can see that slide. Yeah, so this for this uh, feature. So I'll let Sidesh C -C uh, to represent for the 45 source. 45 source. So Sidesh? Um, oh, okay. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, can you please uh, uh, continue presenting the slides? Then I can I can ask you to switch the slides. Would that work? So you you want to present uh, um, my slide or your slide? Yes, your your slide. Okay, okay. So he he just used my slide. He talks, you present, you show slides. <laughs> okay. So just let me know yeah. when you want to switch to the next one. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mm. All right, so uh, 45 source equals 3. So this is, uh, the, the, the macro itself is not a new feature. Uh, for a quick recap on 45 source for the uh, uninitiated, uh, it's a macro that's, uh, that, that uh, developers can dis uh, define, uh, which then uh, causes glibc to add some extra checking uh, uh, in, in some of its functions, like say mem copy, struct copy, and so on, and that uh, the bounce checking is done using uh, a built-in called built-in object size, uh, which returns the constant size of uh, a pointer uh, to to uh, various objects. So uh, the 40, 45 source is not new. Uh, 45 source equals three also. Uh, was introduced about a year and a half ago in uh, GDFC 34. And uh, what 45 source equals 3 does is that it uses built in dynamic object size instead of built in object size to determine the, the object size of a function. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, built in dynamic object size in the next slide, but uh, just to give a background, uh, at the time that uh, it was implemented in GDFC 2.34. Uh, it was LLVM only because LLVM was the only compiler that supported uh, built-in dynamic object size. Uh, we implemented 45 source equals 3 because, uh, in theory, built-in dynamic object size should give better results than built-in object size. Uh, at the time that we did the implementation, we did not know by how much it would improve. Uh, we know now, which we'll find out later. Uh, but uh, because of that, at that time, I think uh, Britain dynamic object size was not implemented in GCC because the GCC community needed a clearer specification of semantics before you know, going out and, and implementing something like this. Uh, so that's basically what I did for GCC 12, which is uh, have have a clearer specification of semantics for built-in dynamic object size as it would behave in GCC, and uh, we added that in GCC 12. And uh, subsequently, uh, we also added uh, uh, support for GCC 12 in uh, GLIPC 2.35 for uh, 45 source. I'm sorry, there's a typo in the in the slide. It says 2.3. I did not backward anything to 2.3. That should be 2.35. Uh, next slide, please. 
Right. So what is built-in uh, dynamic object size? So built-in dynamic object size is uh, in, in many ways similar to built-in object size in the sense that it returns uh, the number of bytes uh, from the pointer to the end of the object that the pointer points to. Uh, by definition, it is an estimate, meaning that uh, the pointer could be pointing to uh, one of many different objects, and based on that, uh, you would either get a maximum estimate or a minimum estimate based on the type of uh, estimate that you request. However, uh, there are two differences, main differences from built-in object size. One is that the return size need not be a constant, so it could be an expression that's evaluated at runtime. And uh, the second uh, difference from built-in object size is that in practice, uh, you would tend to get the precise object size uh, whenever it's possible. However, that's that's in practice right now. Uh, that is not a guarantee, right? So there could be situations in future where we decide that built-in dynamic object size will give you an estimate where a precise object size is not possible. You know, uh, so instead of bailing out, we'll try to give you a max maximum. Uh, estimate as, as a return value uh, so that we have even greater coverage than, than what we have now. So the other thing that built-in dynamic object size does is that on failure, it tries to uh, uh, compute the object size, the, the static object size. And finally, built-in object size then may fail and, and return size min or size max. That's, uh, as is appropriate uh, according to the object uh, object size type. So potentially this has a performance overhead and size overhead. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, more later. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we in, we implemented built-in dynamic object size uh, and 45 source equals three. And uh, the next thing to do was to uh, have distributions adopted. And OpenSUSE was essentially the first mover. Uh, Martin Lishka, I don't know if he's if he's in the room. Uh, Martin, if you're there, wave to the camera. <laughs> so uh, Martin was the, the uh, like almost single-handedly responsible for doing most of the testing here, and uh, he he built uh, almost all of the packages in uh, OpenSUSE. Uh, filed a bunch of bugs. Uh, found a number of issues in in the implementation. Helped us fix them. And then he found and reported a number of bugs with, in various packages. And uh, we were able to uh, essentially make the distribution more secure as a result. Uh, I decided to take a more conservative approach in Fedora, uh, where I wanted to get some metrics first uh, before you know, uh, making a proposal to switch the entire distribution to uh, 45 source equals 3. Uh, but now that OpenSUSE has not completely broken, uh, I'm a little more confident about uh, jumping in. So basically, the kind of metrics I, I want to consider before uh, making the proposal, or uh, maybe make, making a different proposal, which is not a system-wide one, but you know, uh, specific packages, is to first to, to try and quantify how much better it is. Uh, we found bugs in like a dozen maybe more packages but that's not really a count of uh how good built-in dynamic object size would be compared to built-in object size I, I wanted to get like a stronger justification for that uh the second question or second and third question is how much does it bloat binary size and how much does it slow things down and uh that those those questions are still outstanding uh next slide please Uh, can you, yeah okay great uh, so how much better is it and that's we we have an answer for that right uh, and to get that answer I, I wrote a GCC plugin uh, called Fortify Metrics the link to the plugin is, is in the slides uh, what that plugin does is for every translation unit uh, it, it runs just before the tree object size pass and for every built-in object size it computes the static object size and dynamic object size. And uh, it, it records success. Uh, basically, if 
if it's able to compute the static object size, it'll uh, that's like score one for built-in object size. And likewise, if it's able to compute the dynamic object size, that's score one for dynamic object size. And based on that, we get like a ratio uh, uh, indicating out of say 100 built-in object size calls, how many of those uh, were successful. And if they were replaced with built-in dynamic object size, uh, what would be the success rate? And that essentially became a proxy uh, to determine how, how effective 45 source equals three would be uh, compared to 45 source equals two. Uh, so I started with three, uh, I, I essentially did three sets of packages. Uh, two of them I have documented here. Um, the metrics for the third one, and actually all three of them, are in the spreadsheet that I have linked at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so the first one was uh, a set of uh, code Fedora pack packages that constituted about 20 or 28 of them. And uh, in those packages, uh, built-in object size, the number of, the, the percentage of built-in object size calls that succeeded were about 5.6%. Uh, whereas if they were replaced with built-in dy dynamic object size, they would have uh, succeeded a quarter of the time, 25% of the time. And uh, we saw similar numbers for the Fedora server group as well. Uh, this is not, the 96 packages are not the entire server group, it's, it's uh, a subset of that. And again, we saw like almost a, a four times uh, improvement in coverage of, of fortified functions, like built-in object size versus built-in dynamic object size. Uh, the third set, which is not in here, uh, was a set of uh, 10,000 packages, of which around 6,000 gave useful results. And in that, the improvement in coverage, uh, built-in object size versus dynamic object size, w was a factor of two and a half. So it, it's, it's roughly two and a half times uh, better at succeeding and at getting the object size than uh, built-in object size. Uh, I'll, I'll probably do some more tests to kind of get uh, a sense of how this is, but then at the face of it, the numbers are very, very good. Uh, one anecdotal example, which is not in the slides, is that of pseudo. So the coverage for built-in object size for pseudo was one and a half percent. And uh, if it was replaced with built-in dynamic object size, uh, the coverage would go all the way up to 47%, like nearly half of the calls would succeed. So um, there are a number of uh, packages which have this kind of drastic improvement in, uh, in fortification uh, coverage. And next slide, please. All right, so it wasn't all uh, like good news. There, there, there were some issues as well. And one interesting thing that uh, came up uh, during this, uh, this testing was uh, the fact that the built-in object size coverage uh, success rate was so low that there were interfaces in GLFC that were just not tested. Uh, uh, the uh, interfaces I'm referring to are the, the debug underscore check uh, functions because they they almost would never succeed in like actual uh, application scenarios. So uh, there were a couple of interesting occasions uh, we encountered that. First was SNPrintf, uh, where the checking function would just look, just compare the length argument with the object size and fail if that did not uh, fall within bounds. And uh, it, it did not really wait for an actual overflow to happen. Uh, it could well be possible that the format specifiers uh, would expand to something that is within the buffer bounds. But because the length is not representative of the buffer, uh, the checking function, the underscore check function would uh, fail with the buffer, buffer overflow. So in this case, we, we decided that GLFC is doing the right thing uh, because the standards very explicitly state that length should be uh, the size of the buffer. Uh, so we decided that uh, we are going to remain stricter than what is actually required. 
so that's that's how we resolved that uh, issue. But then there was another issue which fell into pretty much the same uh, category, which was WCR to MB, where uh, the checking function expects MB curl max uh, as the size of the destination buffer. And if it's not that size, it would uh, fail with a buffer overflow. Now, POSIX allows any length in there as long as uh, it is sufficient to uh, uh, to, to uh, house the, the translated uh, bytes. Uh, the, the problem over here was that if, uh, if WCR, uh, if, if the application was not built with uh, 45 source, uh, there could potentially be some uh, silent overreads because uh, the, the implementation for WCR to MB assumed that it had MB curve max available. So we decided to uh, fix this by making uh, the GLIPC WCR to MB POSIX compliant and actually allow uh, variable length buffers uh, in there and have built in object size kind of protect us, uh, 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 built in dynamic object size protect us with 45 of CPS3. So here we actually fix GLIPC to make sure that uh, we're compliant with, with POSIX. So the third uh, class of GLIPC problems that, that we ran into was, uh, and, and it's not resolved, I should have probably raised this at the GLPC buff, but I'm, I, I don't want to work on it immediately, so I, I did not really uh, look at that. And that was uh, the utility of malloc uh, usable size. So system D, and uh, I think that, that there may be other applications that do this as well. Uh, what they do is they use uh, malloc usable size uh, to look at uh, whether uh, the chunk, the, the memory chunk that they have, there's actually, uh, whether there's actually space at the end of the chunk, and they just end up using that space instead of calling realloc, because uh, realloc, and this is a, a problem with realloc, uh, takes too long to return essentially the same chunk, right? So uh, it basically what system B and potentially other applications are trying to do is to work around a performance issue in realloc. Now, uh, there, is, there is a system D issue that I've quoted, uh, which, uh, which looks through all of that. Now, the problem here is that uh, malloc usable size is a diagnostics only interface. And uh, it is documented as specifically that, that it is supposed to be used only for diagnostics. It is not uh, a way to kind of safely overflow your buffer. It's, it's, it's absolutely not that, so don't use it that way. But uh, maybe what we need to do on, on the GLFC front is to discourage this a little more strongly. Right? Uh, one way to do that would be to have malloc usable size always return the precise size that was requested. Uh, and the other way would be to uh, potentially like, deprecate the symbol uh, move it to libc malloc debug so that it is used only for diagnostics and uh, you know move on that way. So the challenge with returning the precise size is that we don't record the size anywhere in, in libc malloc. So we don't, we don't really have a way to do that at the moment. We'd have to do some sort of rewrite uh, to actually support that, which may have some overhead. So it's, it's not a simple solution. And uh, that is why I don't want to work on it on, on an immediate basis. Uh, but somewhere down the line, we, we need to tackle this uh, and, and uh, make sure that the malloc usable size does the right thing. Next slide, please. Right. So until now, uh, I, I had looked at 45 source equals 3 as a mitigation for buffer overflows. And uh, that's, that's essentially how I uh, envisioned it to work. However, because of the effectiveness of uh, finding object sizes, uh, what it essentially became in some cases is uh, a kind of a validator for object lifetimes. <laughs> and it, it, it ended up uh, kind of bringing to life some dark parts of the C standards, uh, specifically uh, the use of pointers after they have been freed. 
right? So use of use after three is undefined. We, we all know that, and uh, developers in general would be very very, uh, or at least it would be on their radar to be careful about not dereferencing a pointer that has been three. Uh, mistakes happen. That's that's why we have jobs, right? Uh, but in practice. Uh, it is considered okay to use the point of value, you know, the numeric value of the pointer, as long as we don't dereference it. However, the standards don't allow it. The standards do not allow using the pointer in any form, neither the value nor the dereference. So, uh, what happens with Fortifier Source 6 plus 3, and we saw that with Autogen, uh, the package, uh, is that uh, if you have a, a pointer that was realloc, and uh, uh, if you're if you're optimizing uh, for for copies where where you compare the old pointer with the new pointer and see that they're they're, they're the same, and because of that you avoid uh, say updating the structure the, the object. Let's say your object has references to the pointer. It's, it's like a self referencing thing. Uh, it doesn't update the pointers inside. So that's that's an optimization, right? Uh, but at the same time, you forget to refresh the pointer. So what happens with 4, 5, 6, 3 is that it assumes that it's the old object that you're referring to, and it does not uh, look at the new size. And as a result, it it, uh, it fails with a buffer overflow. So uh, unfortunately, because of this, this whole behavior, 4, 5, 6, 3 ends up enforcing this uh, the point of value use uh, uh, invalidation uh, very strictly. And uh, we want to try and make this a little more lenient. We don't want to support uh, point of value use all the time, right? Uh, because of which it's, it's uh, recommended, like I would recommend applications actually refresh the pointer as well so that the compiler can see that the new size, uh, but wherever possible, we want to try and make sure that, that the object size computation takes into consideration the realloc uh, wherever it can see it. So that's not something to do uh, for the future. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so other implications in future work. So GCC 13, uh, UB San and GCC 13 already uses dynamic object sizes. So I, I reckon once stage one closes and, and distributions start testing GCC 13, we'll, we'll see some interesting things coming out of that, uh, especially because the coverage is uh, so so much higher uh, than, uh, than was expected. Uh, fortification metrics gathering is in, in progress. I'm, I'm starting to work on size metrics uh, I'll probably do some performance analysis as well uh, to get a sense of how much the, uh, the the overhead is. So that's that's in progress. Uh, I want to make built-in dynamic object size a little less cruel. Uh, try to make the post realloc uh, uses go through as much as as the compiler can see at least. Uh, there's more scope for object size detection improvements, and this is. Like not just in the compiler, so I've, I've mentioned a couple of use cases in the compiler where uh, we make offsets less important, where uh, we try uh, wherever offset, offsets are like non-determinable, if they're volatile or whatever it is, at least try and return like the whole object size or sub-object size as, as we find it uh, and not bail out completely so that we have some semblance of uh, some some limited overflow protection, if not complete overflow, overflow protection. Uh, there's stir loop, stir and loop, uh, which we don't recognize this at the moment. I have patches on uh, GCC patches pending review right now for that. So hopefully that will make it into uh, GCC 13. And then additional annotations in uh, in applications and libraries uh, for like adding at attribute access, adding attribute malloc, so that the object size uh, detection subsystem can, can take advantage of that. And finally, there's, there's the whole question of adding, uh, handling the flex adding. 
Instructs and Flex Array Members Instructs, uh, which incidentally, complete coincidence, <laughs> King is working on it. So King, over to you. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, yeah, the time, yeah. Do we have enough time? Yeah, so I'll quickly go over this uh, ongoing project. So, yeah, start from the background, yeah. Yeah, I think the background is very, yeah, important. Uh, so the flexible array member uh, was officially standardized a very long time ago in C99. And uh, it's mainly used for variable length uh, array. So it has three uh, character, three feature. One, it must be in the last field of a structure. And uh, this structure must has another named data structure, named data structure. And uh, the flexible array members declared without dimension nor size. So this is a C99 yeah, a standard. But before C99, yeah, compiler already provide this functionality in yeah, uh, GCC stand extension or some convention for, yeah, there are three uh, different uh, use, uh, uh, legacy usage is a zero length array uh, of a structure can be treated as a flexible array member. A one element array can be treated or only normal array. If it's in the training uh, of a structure, it will be treated as a, a flexible training array. So this is uh, uh, complicated in the C side. In C++, it, uh, yeah, it makes things more complicated because C++ standard uh, doesn't support the uh, flexible uh, array member. So if a C++ programmer want to use the, this feature, it, uh, he has to use the, G, the GCC extension, uh, the zero length array or the one element array conversion. So this is the current situation. So this is some example. This is a C99 standard uh, array, yeah, uh, flexible array member. So, and this is a zero length array. This is a one element array, yeah, example. So this is a normal fixed size array. Uh, it's non-treating, so it's not in the last uh, uh, field of the structure. So currently GCC treat is not as a normal array. So the built-in object size can uh, report the size of this array and the size of the, the, this uh, member is correctly. But if this normal array is in the last field of the structure, then current GCC will treat it as a flexible array member. So even though its size of it still work, but the built-in object size, as Sadeh just mentioned, that's, that's why it's very important for the 40, 45 source and also, yeah, uh, for the bound checking, those kind of thing. The built-in object size uh, cannot report its uh, size anymore. So this is uh, uh, the, the initial issue we are trying to uh, uh, resolve. So this is some, abbre some abbreviation for this talk. Yeah, so just uh, to simplify the talk. So the current situation in GCC is uh, since Legacy C, the old C code before C99 and uh, the non-standard C++ code might use all the this different uh, extension convention as a flexible array member. So historically, GCC has to uh, conservatively, conservatively treat all this uh, uh, training array as a flexible uh, remember, in order to uh, generate the correct code by default. Uh, later, when GCC add some warning, the array bound checking, those kind of uh, warning, that's in a later stage, they are uh, doing, doing better, it will not treat the, uh, the, the N, the normal, uh, 
normal uh, array as a flexible array by default, but still the GCC extension, zero length and one length array still treated as a flexible array member. Therefore, in current GCC, we have two different default behavior. So older faces treat all this as the flexible array member, but the newer faces, the, those new added warning uh, faces, uh, they behave strictly, but they still treat uh, the zero and the one as the flexible array member. So this is the current situation in GCC. So there are two major issues. The first issue is for the uh, standard conforming code, that is for the newer application uh, writing which conform to the C99 standard, uh, they, the GCC gener generated two conservative code for them. So the, uh, the some of the sites need to be identified but cannot, do, cannot be identified by GCC due to this conser con conservation. Uh, and uh, the other issue is uh, there are inconsistent default behavior during the GCC different phases. So this behavior will make the developer very confusing. Yeah, during my study of this issue, in the beginning, it took me quite some time to understand the different phase, how, how do they treat the, the, this training array differently. So yeah, it's very confusing. So in order to make GCC better, yeah, externally and internally, I think we need to resolve these uh, issues. So uh, I think the requirement for resolve this issue is uh, first we need to generate correct code for the legacy C and the non-standard C++ code. And uh, at the same time, we also need to generate better code for the standard conforming application. And, and uh, we also need to align different uh, analysis phase into, uh, in GCC consistently to let them behave consistently to enable uh, future, to enable the easy maintenance for future de development work. And, uh, in, and uh, the last requirement is we need to encourage the standard conforming coding style. So GCC should uh, report a warning when the user uh, writes a code that's not uh, standard conforming. So the user can change their code uh, to make it standard conforming. Yeah, so that's the requirement for the, the whole problem. Then uh, the proposal is, yeah, we will provide a new option and a, a corresponding new attribute uh, with multiple level control of the, uh, how strictly we treat the training array of a flexible array member. So the attribute can be used with and or without the option and the attribute has higher priority than the option, yeah. So that's the uh, current uh, design. And uh, the multiple level will satisfy the different requirement. The zero will be the least strict level. That's the default behavior uh, for the current GCC. So if you didn't re uh, specify this option, then GCC uh, keeps the current behavior without any change. The level three is the strictest level. That's the uh, standard conforming. Uh, so with the uh, level three, uh, only the standard conforming uh, C99 uh, syntax can be uh, treated as a, a flexible array member. All the other uh, array uh, will be treated uh, yeah, as the normal array. So uh, this is a default when this option is present but not specify any value. Yeah, so this is the feature we are trying to add. And this, uh, this uh, uh, 
comment during the code review phases uh, raised by Richard, Richard and uh, he suggested me to add one uh, additional warning to warn the, uh, uh, warn the strict flexible array in different level. But after uh, my study, I, I think uh, if we just uh, update the current available array bound checking warning, then it should save the same purpose. Um, yeah, so just a quick question. I, I don't mm. really understand. You mentioned some passes uh, treat different flexible arrays differently. Yeah. But as far as I understand, uh, the, the type size of a, of a, of a flexible array uh. um, it will, will, will always be null. So that, 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 that property, I would have thought, shouldn't change between different passes in the, in the middle end. So I don't really understand how, uh, yeah, this can be, behavior can be different for different passes, yet yeah, it's determined by the type size of the type. Type size? Yeah. Yeah, type size. Type size, the, for the standard conforming, the type size of the standard syntax will be none. You, you will get a, a compilation error. Yeah. yeah. But that shouldn't change between passes. Yeah, so I think that one. Currently, I'm still don't quite uh, don't quite know how to fix this different uh, default behavior. Yeah, so that's uh, something I'm still considering, but I don't, don't know how to do it yet, yeah. So I'm not sure whether I understand your question well or not. Uh, maybe we can discuss <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So this is, this is, after my study, I think, yeah, we just uh, need to update the current available warning, a rebound checking, and issue the uh, new warning at a different level. Then the, this, this is the new strict flexible array warning will not be needed anymore. So that's uh, the proposal. Yeah, so we will try to uh, update all the phases uh, with multiple level. And also, after that, up, update all the warnings, the array bound checking and the string operation overflow, those kind of warning uh, with multiple level two in order to make GCC all consistent. And uh, uh, a new warning, the zero length array, this, this one I'm still not very sure. Yeah, because I, I discussed with the kernel people, I think, I think this one might not need it. Yeah, because uh, if we update the array bound warning uh, correctly, then we don't need this one. So the implementation, currently, yeah, we have some discussing on the implementation. So the major work is in the front end, in the C and C++ front end, we will, uh, we will add a IR, new IR flag, the declare not flexible array to the field declaration. And uh, in C++, C and C++ front end, we will set this new array based on whether it's a zero lens or one lens or a standard conforming flexible array and uh, the option and also the attribute value and whether it's a last field or not. All this information together to decide uh, uh, how to set this uh, new field. And then in the middle end, we will use this new field to update the current interface. So the current interface to query whether this is a flexible array in the middle end is, uh, and the name is very, yeah, it also has issue. Uh, array at structure end P. So this name I think is misleading but it's the current interface. I think in a later patch, I will yeah, uh, do some cleanup, cleanup for the re re rename it. Yeah, in the, after this is done, I will uh, update all the warning, uh, warning phase with a multiple array. And the last one, yeah, I think uh, maybe it's not needed anymore. So currently, I separate all the patches into three sets, the previous, 
the previous A, A, B, C is the first set. It's already uh, done the fourth version, and I think the first ver version is under reviewing and uh, have very minor, uh, yeah, I think a, a little minor wording change should be fine, yeah. And uh, then I will work on the set two and set three. So uh, uh, also let, uh, yeah, the clown already have this option. So this clown's option also has, we, we discussed it, and but clown, they accept earlier than us, but they miss the uh, uh, level three. And the level three, I think uh, that's a quite important level. So I, I believe clown need uh, another patch to get the level three uh, accepted, yeah. So, yeah, so the future work for this, this project, I think, uh, is first finish all the work I'm planning. And then, yeah, we have a good discussion with kernel people. We might add a new attribute to annotate the bounds of the flexible array member to enable the flexible array bound checking. So this will be a new attribute. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, and I will try to study it to make it, uh, to think it, uh, make it into GCC. And then we will use this new attribute for the array bound checking of the flexible array, uh, arrays, and also enable the built-in dynamic object uh, size uh, CD just mentioned, to enable it in more, more cases to make it more powerful. Yeah, so I think that's, that's ending the talk. Yeah, thank you. I think we are run, run out of time, right? Yeah, sorry for. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.